Um, all right, I think I'll get started. Um, <clears throat> thanks for making the time to come to this presentation. It's a busy time of the semester. Uh, so today I hope to tell you about uh, some recent work. Uh, actually, first let me introduce myself. My name is Nishargo. Uh, I'm a graduate student at MIT, and I want to talk about some recent work I've done with uh, Liang Fu at MIT and uh, a postdoc, Yang Zhang. And uh, the, to the topic is called a giant proximity exchange and flat churn band in 2D magnet semiconductor heterostructures. So the setting I want to describe first and motivated first is the is in the title uh, 2D magnet semiconductor heterostructures. Um, and I also want to highlight some main, the main two highlights are also in the title, a giant proximity exchange, which is useful for various things, and uh, the uh, the fact that flat churn bands naturally arise and all of the all of the interesting things that can result from that. Okay, so to begin, I'll talk about some, some motivation for this topic. And the motivation is a recent surge of interest in uh, Van der Waals and Moray magnets. So Van der Waals magnets themselves uh, in the monolayer are, are these are magnets that are two-dimensional and they are easily cleavable and stackable. Twist, you can twist them and translate them. Uh, in particular, a very famous family are the chromium trihalides. And they're interesting because they're intrinsically magnetic in two dimensions. The uh, fluctuations uh, do not destroy the magnetic order. And, and I mean, a short reason for that is just because there's some out of plane or in plane anisotropy. And um, these have become, people have been exploring this experimentally and theoretically. On this slide, I have just two examples of experimental um, results. Uh, one is from the Cornell group, uh, showing the emergence of a non-collinear magnetic state in twisted bilayer chromium uh, triiodide. And uh, CRI3 is ferromagnetic in the monolayer, but when you stack it and twist it, uh, there are regions like the RR stacking um, uh, Can everyone see my mouse? I'm just curious. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the RR stacking, where uh, where you see that there's a, a the ferromagnetic exchange is satisfied, and that there are regions where it's not satisfied, and so to there's some frustration, and there will be some twisting, and that's the the idea behind the non-collinear phases they observe. But non-collinear, uh, you can get something even crazier ex experimentally, and the uh, and this the second result here is. Uh, I haven't combed the literature of experiments on this, but uh, this is just a result on the bottom that came out last night on the archive, uh, claiming that there are two uh, distinct phases of skirmions in uh, a Van der Waals magnet interface. Um, uh, theoretically, there's a lot more work done with simulations and so forth, uh, micromagnetic simulations, uh, and in this, in these theory works that I've just listed here, uh, in the moiré of two uh, two layers of Van der Waals magnets, uh, it's claimed that you can skirmions basically naturally arise. And so, just a quick definition of skirmions: skirmions are twisting of the magnetic uh, order parameter that has a unit winding around the unit sphere. One skirmion has topological charge one. And um, so there's this paper, for example, by uh, the Balenz group, a theoretical paper by the Balenz group from UCSB, where a uh, where a ferromagnet is uh, layered on top of uh, Van der Waals anti-ferromagnet and uh, twisted. And there are phases that could be called more skirmions. Uh, similarly, in uh, a couple other theory papers. And, and the, the attractive feature of this is that it's zero magnetic field. So it's an entirely different mechanism than the typical mechanism for skirmions. Skirmions over the last decade have often been talked about in the context of the DM interaction in a magnetic field. And so it's exciting that you can get a tunable 
uh, skirmion phase where the skirmions occur regularly and not just isolated skirmion bubbles that are hard to do, predictably create or control. And uh, it's also in zero magnetic field. In the, bottom, in the bottom left, I've just drawn what a skirmion lattice could look like when you take a simple onsatz of just three spin spirals rotated by 120 degrees and normalized everywhere on the plane. So this is called the triple Q skirmion lattice. So this is the inspiration behind um, considering the possibility of layering a semiconductor such as graphene or a van der Waals semiconductor uh, like, uh, like uh, a TMD um, on top of a van der Waals magnet or a twisted van der Waals magnet. And, and there are several things you can think about when you have such a structure, when you have itinerant electrons, I should mention that the van der Waals magnets are usually insulating. So uh, there are no itinerant electrons, but once you layer, uh, once you have some itinerant electrons in the system, you can ask about many interesting things. Uh, for example, what is the effect of the magnetism on the transport? Typically, there, there, there's known to be a topological Hall effect when there are uh, skirmions and so forth. Uh, is, and I'll talk a little bit about the general Hall effect uh, in, in these heterostructures. Uh, but also, you can ask about strongly correlated physics and whether you can achieve flat churn bands. And in that case, if you can, um, how are the strongly correlated phases altered? Because the wave functions will be altered by the skirmion texture compared to just usual land all levels. So, so how will this alter the, the strongly correlated physics if there is any in, in such system? So first I'll talk a little bit about the effect of magnetism on the transport properties in, in such heterostructures. So a result is just that transport, um, transport can act as a sensor of a nonlinear texture. So it's always useful to have tabletop experiments that can tell you about what the magnetic texture is uh, that you have in front of you. And it turns out that transport can act quite reliably to tell you whether or not you have a nonlinear texture. Uh, quite generically, there will be some anomalous hull effect in, in, a, in a texture. Um, so on the left here, I've plotted a skirmion crystal, the band structure in the presence of a skirmion crystal. And you see a, a quantized anomalous Hall effect for the, first two, for the first two bands, the lowest bands. They each carry churn number one. And some generic anom anomalous Hall uh, response in the, in the rest of the band, due to the rest of the band structure, low-lying band structure. Uh, on the right, I've plotted the band structure in the presence of a canted vortex lattice. The main distinction is that a canted vortex lattice is not skirmion-like. It doesn't enclose net winding. It doesn't have net winding. Um, and so one could generically expect uh, that there's no anomalous Hall effect, there's no topological Hall effect, and it's just sort of uh, topologically trivial, but it's not. And there's some anomalous Hall effect generically that you could expect uh, in even a non-winding texture. So it seems like there's, uh, there's, there could be potentially even be a sort of dictionary between the transport features and the actual, uh, the exact mag magnetic texture in the, that, that you have in front of you in the lab. And this is, this is on one hand an interesting thing to explore just because it'll give you uh, more to uh, another handle on the magnetism, but it's, I think, interesting in its own right. And here I have plotted just a heuristic of what a, uh, what's happening. This is uh, in a plot of a skirmion texture and uh, a Hall effect due to it. Uh, and throughout this talk, I'm gonna use J as the electron magnetic, the itinerant electron magnet, magnetic spin exchange coupling. Um, and I should also, mentioned that throughout this talk, I'm just, I, I should distinguish against, distinguish what I'm talking about uh, with the, what's called the new equals one quantum Hall ferromagnet. Uh, the, the, there are skirmions that arise in the uh, new equals one quantum Hall ferromagnet that are entirely due to the uh, electrons. There are no local moments that are um, pinned in space. And um, here I'm considering actually a local magnetic texture just, just to make the distinction. So that, that's just a brief discussion of the transport features. 
Um, here is the Hamiltonian that, that's being considered, uh, just a parabolic dispersion with a Huns coupling, a local Huns coupling with the electron spin and the local spin. One question we can naturally ask after taking a look at just two uh, generic band structures at weak uh, Huns coupling J, so J is not that large here, is how flat can we make this band structure? So this band structure shows significant splitting and flattening even with, uh, with relatively small J. And um, it makes sense since J is a uh, perturbation that's going to um, uh, split the bands that J might have to be quite large uh, in order to get perfectly flat or nearly perfectly flat bands. Uh, but the question is, can even if that's the case, can we make uh, flat bands? And in, and, and generically, uh, uh, or, or and we can also ask whether these bands will be topological, or under what conditions these bands will be topological. So that's the question I want to address next. Uh, however, I, I've already mentioned that we probably need large J for this to work in, in the real world. And so, so one thing that uh, that sort of motivated this as well is a search for whether there exists 2D magnet semiconductor heterostructures with a large exchange coupling J. And that's what I want to talk about next, um, searching for a strong proximity exchange coupling J. So uh, in some uh, great uh, DFT work by uh, my collaborator Yang, uh, he found that there is a heterostructure after scanning through multiple combinations of van der Waals, magnets, and TMDs, he found that there is a giant exchange splitting in the gamma valley uh, between uh, MOS2 and CRBR3, chromium tribromide, which is a van der Waals magnet. So here I've just shown the, ladder, the lattice structures of MOS2 and CRBR3, the, the wave functions, and um, there, so the, the, the spin splitting is 14 MeV, uh, or assuming a, a G factor of two, that's effectively 120 Tesla. Uh, in comparison, WSE2 and chromium triiodide have a spin splitting of 3.5 MeV. Uh, the, the analogous uh, number for graphene and a typical van der Waals magnet is in the range of one MeV. And uh, he, the, the key here uh, that we found is that the, in the gamma valley, the, the wave functions are extended out of plane, perpendicular out of plane, whereas in the K and K prime values, which are um, of separate interest, they're, uh, they have, they're in plane. And so there is a stronger uh, interlayer exchange coupling when the, when the wave functions are extended out of plane and that is some sort of an explanation for why such a large exchange setting could be found in this uh, heterostructure at the gamma valley and not at the K valley. Uh, so this is equivalent to a 2D half metal with density up to 0.83 times 10 to 13 inverse centimeters squared, which means that we can dope it with holes until we get to this density and then we have a metal with a single spin. Um, just some details that I can come back to later if anyone has questions. Uh, the, the stacking works out so that a two by two unit cell of uh, the magnet is commensurate with a single unit cell of MOS2 with less than 1% strain. And here are some plots of the band structure of the heterostructure and then the, uh, the TMD layer and the magnetic layer. So this, this motivates us to actually take this uh, picture serious or actually uh, search more seriously theoretically for uh, whether flat churn bands can arise in 2D magnet semiconductor heterostructures. In particular, just motivated by the finding of such a large exchange coupling and hopeful that you know, uh, such large exchange couplings can be found in other heterostructures in the future. Uh, I'm going to consider a very simple model with large in the large J limit. The sim same model that I wrote down before, parabolic dispersion with a Huns coupling term, uh, electron spin, local spin. And in the large exchange limit, this model has been, uh, this model has been shown to uh, just at first order perturbation theory 
in the inverse of this large parameter, Jm psi squared, where psi is the period of a magnetic texture. This model reduces to the equation two, which uh, you can observe is just an electron in a, a U1 gauge field uh, plus a scalar potential term that is uh, that depends on the gradient of the spin texture. So it, the electron will um, tend to uh, avoid regions of high spin gradient. So this is promising uh, because we can we know that Landau levels have are, 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 the, par are the paradigm of flat churn bands. And uh, this is essentially a Landau, this is essentially the Landau level problem, except with a periodic magnetic field, which I'm calling here BE, B emergent. Uh, the periodic mag magnetic field involves, is actually equal to uh, the spin winding density. So this is, that's what this formula is. And all that means is that when I integrate equation three over a single skirmion unit cell, I should get uh, H bar, sorry, H over E, Planck's constant over E, a single flux quantum. Uh, so it, it's, it's a Landau level problem with an emergent magnetic field and a uh, scalar potential. So it's still not obvious that flat churn bands will arise, but we do find um, that <clears throat> for, for generic uh, skirmion ansatz, um, a flat churn band does arise at a specific magnetization so that's what M bar is. M bar is the out of plane magnetization in the Z direction. <clears throat> and <clears throat> uh, the, these plots uh, show the Z component in red and blue and the in plane components as black arrows. So this is what a uh, skirmion crystal would look like uh, for varying magnetization. And the band structure shows the flattening of the lowest band. So this is, uh, this is relevant to low densities. Uh, at a specific magnetization, and I've also plotted the local density of states. I, I should I should emphasize that we've used equation one in all these calculations, and not the uh, the limit, the perturbative limit. That was that I only use that as motivation and uh, to give a, a picture of what's going on. Um, each band has turn number one, uh, and okay. And lastly, the qu the natural question to ask is how robust is this flatness? I could have did I choose like a really nice skirmion texture. Um, is this just super fine tuned? And uh, the answer is, you know, don't think so because <clears throat> the skirmion texture that we used was this very generic triple Q ansatz, which has been used extensively throughout the literature. Uh, just the sum of three, a very simple, uh, well, well, the simplest skirmion texture that I know, which is just the superposition of spin spirals with uh, local normalization. So it, the the local moment has unit norm. And it has uh, several parameters, one of which is psi, the magnetic uh, period, which we can scale out of the problem. Alpha, which is the coplanarity, how in plane is it? And the, uh, the third parameter is the magnetization. And so for varying alpha, the magnetization, there's sort of still this magic magnetization around 0.2. And, um, that uh, so that that's the parabolic dispersion case. So we can also ask about um, what happens, you know, in the in the what's the, what's the relevant what's the analogous physics for coupling graphene to a Van der Waals magnet. So we can also consider the Dirac case. And so I've I've just considered a simple Hamiltonian, which is. Um, a Dirac Hamiltonian with tau being some pseudo spin, such as sublattice, a sublattice degree of freedom. And again, sigma is the electron spin. So this is just a Dirac Hamiltonian with the same Hunts coupling. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that in the, the, the emergent gauge field limit is now, uh, so it's still strong J, but it's J psi over V being large. So this could also be achieved with small Dirac velocity. Um, and in this limit, the first order perturbation theory uh, effective Hamiltonian is very simple. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an extra term like the one like the previous equation did. Oh, in, in the bottom left. So this is just a Dirac electron coupled to a gauge field A. 
the um, here is the, the emergent gauge field plotted. Um, so this is the the winding density equivalently. Uh, just and, and, and the interesting thing is that in this case, the only thing that the electron feels is this emergent gauge field, and there's no scalar potential. So interestingly, perhaps due to the simplicity of the Dirac model and the large exchange limit, uh, you always get a flat churn band. <clears throat> And uh, so here I've plotted, I've, uh, I've reproduced what I've plotted previously for the Schrodinger case. And this is the, these are the analogous plots for the Dirac case. Um, the, so, and again, I have used just equation one, not used the perturbative limit. That's only for motivation. I've plotted the emergent field uh, up here, which is more relevant to the Dirac case because that's the only field that, that the electrons feel there is what you could call sort of like a zeroth lambda level, a zeroth emergent lambda level in, in this emergent gauge field that is perfectly flat and stays dispersionless. Whereas the others uh, gain some, get some dispersion. Um, uh, and this is, uh, this is solved just by diagonalizing uh, equation one in a unit cell. So there's nothing to worry, no subtleties to worry about about magnetic translation or the magnetic unit cell uh, because equation one makes no reference to a magnetic unit cell or anything like that. So uh, these, these are just band structures in the mini Brillouin zone. But you can also equivalently think of them as Landau levels with some dispersion. And uh, the zeroth Landau level remains dispersionless. And another thing to note is that the local density of states sort of mirrors the emergent gauge field. Um, Okay, so there's a theoretical understanding of this, uh, which is just that a Dirac electron in a periodic magnetic field, if the periodic magnetic field encloses some average flux, uh, will have a flat band. In particular, the zeroth Landau level remains perfectly flat. Uh, you can actually just write, you can write down the wave function for it, and it depends on the uh, emergent gauge, it depends on the periodic magnetic field. Uh, there's zero modes, extensive set of zero modes, and the amazing thing is that there's no fine tuning necessary. And so the, it's, uh, there's no question of whether I, I chose like a, a nice skirmion onsatz or not. It's just for any, any, any skirmion onsatz, any, any spin texture that can be called skirmion like because it encloses net flux, uh, there will be a flat band in the draw case. Okay. Um, Okay, so for uh, so I'd like to conclude and just talk about the um, the interesting things that could come out of this in future directions. Uh, the one natural question to ask is whether we can realize the fractional churn insulator state in 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 skirmionic semiconductor heterostructures. Uh, in particular, the van der Waals magnets seem to um, are, are novel because they don't require an external magnetic field. And so uh, it's plausible that an even more, uh, an even stronger or an even more ambitious thing could be realized, which is the, a fractional quantum anomalous solid state, which is just a zero magnetic field. The interesting thing about this is that the, uh, the wave functions will be different from just ordinary Landau levels because the wave functions are uh, highly dependent on the actual spin texture. Uh, in generically, uh, a previous uh, previous work uh, of ours studied the the wave functions and found that for the draw case, generically they're closely bound to the skirmions, and um, this would, uh, I believe, tend to stabilize uh, Wigner crystal phases. And so, an interesting question is whether the uh, whether there can be perhaps Skirmion slash Wigner crystal phases in, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in this regime or among the strongly correlated phases that, that could be uh, explored here. Uh, a more direct question is just, uh, since we predicted flat churn bands, can we observe an effective mass enhancement due to non coplanar textures in general? Uh, for the drop case, the, uh, the, flat, the zeroth band remains perfectly flat for any skirmion-like texture. 
And and for the parabolic case, if there was a uh, particular magnetization, and uh, there isn't there isn't a actually I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, this is also very uh, this whole talk has been sort of adjacent to a lot of work that's been going on in spintronics, which is interesting. A lot of there's a lot of work in spintronics uh, dedicated to the reading, writing, and transporting of spin textures, and in particular, skirmion textures. Um, and finally, uh, we can ask whether transport can be used as a reliable sensor for non planar textures, and uh, can we create some sort of a dictionary between the transport uh, measurements and, a, and the mag magnetic textures themselves. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and I can certainly take questions. So I have one um, concerning uh, your future direction uh, and the realization of fractional chain insulator. You mentioned that uh, the two by two unit cell of, I can't remember if it was the uh, Van der Waals magnet was equal to the what to one unit cell in the uh, full hetero structure. Does that mean you have uh, two unit of flux um, uh, per unit cell in the, uh, or others, or is it one, one half or two uh, unit of flux per unit cell? Uh, yeah, exactly, this one. Mm, right. Um, so that would depend on, um, so right, it, we found that there's a, a two by two unit cell that's commensurate with the one by one unit cell. And the, uh, the Van der Waals magnet layer, however, can have any sort of spin texture and the spin texture can have a periodicity, which is uh, which is very large compared to the unit cell, right. compared to the lattice constant. So the periodicity that's relevant for the magnetic flux uh, or, or right, how many flux quanta there are per unit cell is the, the periodicity of the magnetic texture. And if it's, and if typically it's, uh, you know, say, Hundreds of unit cells, then um, then we wouldn't have to worry that much about the uh, the lattice scale physics, and the continuum model would be would be appropriate. Right. And so, in particular, yeah, I am I'm considering sort of a large scale skirmions so that a continuum model is appropriate, and um, tiny skirmions that are on the order of a few unit cells actually, I believe, would require a, a different sort of theory and a, and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, an emergent gauge field might not be that helpful for that. An emergent gauge field picture might not be that helpful. Great, thanks. Um, Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. If, if there Actually, are. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, go ahead. If I. Uh, so you also mentioned uh, at the beginning that you were distinguishing the new equal one ferromagnet uh, with a, a local magnetization texture. Is that because, um, uh, yeah, the, the magnetization comes from the uh, Van der Waals magnet and then you can consider it completely fixed in that setup, even if you, you, you uh, it's not changed by adding electrons. I mean, what, what was the difference between the new equal one ferromagnet and the local magnetization texture? Uh, at the beginning. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I did mention that. So the, um, the main thing is that uh, the, the, here we are treating the local magnetic texture on a different footing from the uh, itinerant electrons. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, uh, for example, the spins are different. And so whereas we treat the local magnetic moments classically because of large spin, 
we can't treat the local uh, the spins in uh, the new goals one for a magnetic for a magnet uh, on a different footing. I'm I'm not sure if perhaps there are, uh, there are limits or some some approximations where you can assume that the there's a like an inert background of the spin texture in the new one for a magnet. But really, it's the same electrons providing the spin texture as uh, as our um, yeah tinner electrons, and so um, quantum effects are relevant for this at this to the same extent for all electrons. Um, yeah, so that's the main difference. I, I'd say we're, we're treating the spin texture here classically, entirely classically, and uh, I don't think that's always a good approximation for the 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 quantum Hall ferromagnet. Um, Even if you're for your ethereal structure, where the uh, spin texture comes from another layer, or is that also the basis of your approximation here? That the spin yeah, yeah, exactly. So the the hetero, in the heterostructure, structure, um, the the spin texture is assumed to come from a different layer. So, for example, we could have you know a twisted Van der Waals magnet layer. So bilayer, which hosts the skirmion texture, and um, and then the electrons are proximity coupled to it. Uh, so so since they come from another layer, we can and the uh, the spins are large. We can sort of assume them to be classical, and we uh, so that's the picture I've been using, and I've been neglecting any sort of back reaction to the magnetic texture, where which which would be uh, interesting to consider in general. What in fact. Um, uh, it's possible that doping electrons would change the magnetic texture uh, and change the ground state because they, the electrons do, uh, at least in the drop case, bind quite bind closely to the skirmions. Uh, so that'd be interesting. But I think that Van der Waals magnets are sort of rigid enough that they can't, they're not significantly affected by any mm -hmm. back reaction from the external electrons. Very good, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for attending the talk and enjoy the rest of your